welcome you all back to another episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. We're still in the midst of an unprecedented um, human well-being tragedy combined and even caused by um, political travesty. And we will use that to uh, think even more, uh, I, I guess, observatorily uh, about the past to project for a potentially better future. And for that, uh, we're broadcasting live from three locations, from uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, with the Soto Brown. Hello, uh, everybody. Long Beach, California, with Ron Lindgren and myself Hello. Uh, near uh, Munich, Germany. So good to have you on the show again. Let's uh, bring the first slide up. And needless to say, uh, if you haven't known, Ron, you are a long-term professional and personal friend of Edward Killingsworth, who, as we pointed out through many shows, has like no other shaped uh, the island of Oahu, but also other islands. At the very bottom left is your very own uh, authorship signature signature project of the Kapalua Bay uh, on Maui. And at the top right, we see the first episode with your uh, friend and colleague, um, uh, partner in Killingsworth's uh, late office, uh, Larry Stricker, and this is the Mauna Lani on the Big Island. So um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, we do a little break here. And thank you, Ron, for having stepped in because uh, Larry uh, had to step out uh, for a week. And so we're going to do the volume two of the Mauna Lani uh, next with him. So thanks for stepping in to talk about something very important. And this is uh, going back to uh, you guys, Soto and Ron, here at the National Docomomo Symposium that we were holding on our island of Oahu last year. And you were both keynote speakers. And, and here are sort of, you know, impressions of you guys up on stage. And uh, we were very happy, Ron, that you did not uh, stop on our island you went above and beyond to share with us where this exciting pioneering hospitality typology work that you started uh, on the island led to in, in your business uh, and has spread out all over the world. And in this show, we want to give a little bit of a glimpse of projects in different similar tropical climates. And go to the next slide, which isn't uh, particularly tropical yet, but it gets close to, I know that place very well because this is where I've been for two years before I came to Hawaii. This is the desert, the southwest desert of Arizona, and our desert red will brooder that we have done a show with uh, has shaped this place very well, but you guys as well. So let's jump in. And, and by the way, uh, thanks to talking about Larry. Larry is, by the way, the, uh, the project architect of this, of this project that you now, uh, on, on his behalf, um, uh, talk a little bit about, Ron. Yes, I, I'd like to say that uh, the, the, the source point for all of the, the later work in the Killingsworth office was the original Kahala Hilton in 1964. And it ended up get, getting the office another 221 commissions for hotels and, and uh, resorts. and. The success of that later work, and we're going to look at some of those samples now, uh, really came from lessons that we learned from that hospitality design. So here is the Phoenician Hotel, which is an example of how the Hawaiian resort design informed and inspired a later work. Uh, this is surely, well, it certainly was the most luxurious hotel in Arizona when it opened in 1985. If you look at the, uh, the large picture, it had 474 rooms and 131 freestanding casitas to rent. And they were all built right at the base of uh, the Camelback Mountain in Scottsdale. But it's the desert, but notice how in the foreground, the golf course is beautifully green. There are lagoons running through it. The fact is that Larry Stricker's design idea was to take all of those buildings and form an enormous circle. And that circle surrounded a heavily landscaped swimming pool and uh, garden terraces. And so by doing so, he created a very surprising and welcoming tropical oasis in the desert climes of Arizona. 
the uh, this project came to uh, the Killingsworth office because uh, its owner, Charles Keating, who's sort of the infamous junk bond king who spent some time in federal prison, he and his family loved a stay that they had at the Montelani Bay Hotel. So the happy irony is Larry designs the Montelani Bay Hotel, a client sees it, and then comes to the office and has Larry design him his dream hotel. One last detail. Let, let, me, the, let me answer that, right, Ron, because he just told us before the show that actually what was an inspiration for Larry, which he told us in the last show, was the Mauna Kea Hotel by SOM. And uh, they stayed there first, and you said they didn't like it. So, you know, the Manalani was the real sort of, you know, the, the convincing piece. Yeah, the, the, the Mauna Kea problem for this very large family of the Keatings, the Keatings had four family members that were gold medal swimmers in the Olympics. And these are big, tall kids, and both boys and girls. And unfortunately, if there's one thing to say not so good about Mauna Kea, which is a wonderful modern building, is that the guest rooms are rather small and ordinary. And that's, I think, why they appreciated the larger rooms at Mauna Lani, uh, because the setting at Mauna Kea is, is better than what Mauna Lani had to work with. Yeah, I think that's fascinating that they, we have this this direct line of Mauna Kea Beach Hotel, Mauna Lani Hotel, and then the Phoenician Hotel. Yeah, and, and I'd let's like encourage to our audience to to go to the uh, the legendary video that Harvey Keller did with with ads, which we are referring to at the very bottom right, and you can uh, you will then enjoy ads talking very humorously about that climate, that client background, that scandalous client background. One last thing about the Phoenician I wanted to mention was that the American Precast Concrete Institute selected it the finest piece of concrete work in the United States for that year. Absolutely. And that year was when in the 80s? Do you recall that? It year? opened in 1985. Oh, that's what I remember, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's move on and get a little bit more tropical to the next slide and, and share with us what we see, Ron. Yeah, here we're looking at uh, the Marriott Palm Desert Hotel, which was really a convention facility. For a long time, it was the largest hotel in California at 895 rooms. Uh, but it incorporated a great many things from the earlier Hawaiian work, especially in the use, the lush use of water, the luxuriant use of greenery, and also providing a really memorable arrival experience. In the upper left-hand corner, you see uh, an aerial view looking down onto the project. The entry road curves gracefully over a lagoon, and when the guests get out of their car, they suddenly step into that uh, space you see on the right, which was an enormous atrium. Uh, and it, uh, again, provided a welcome and unexpected touch of a tropical garden as the centerpiece of this enormous space. Uh, waterfalls splashed down on either side of the stairs. The stairs themselves went down to a boat dock. You could get onto a boat at the boat dock, go out through giant sliding glass doors at the front of the hotel, which you see on the left at the center photograph, and, and get to all sorts of amenities that way. Uh, the, the atrium originally had skylights, and for reasons of economy, no doubt, construction cost, value engineering, uh, they eliminated some skylights. This, this was unfortunate in the sense that the shadow play that could have occurred in this enormous space uh, was lost. But even more so, trying to keep the tropical greenery uh, healthy when there wasn't you know, enough natural daylight was a problem. So we had to do some real tricks here. I should say Larry Stricker did, because those palm trees that you see, which are 40 to 50 feet tall, they're, they're real, but they're freeze-dried. So that's the kind of gimmick we had to use uh, to keep uh, the hotel looking green. So yeah, it's, entirely, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's a bunch of phony greenery, unfortunately, or non-living greenery that, that could have been alive. But it's still much better than what we see uh, at the bottom left, right? Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk. I'll talk about what what that sort of uh, barren space in the bottom left corner is in just a few moments. The center picture to the left did show that uh, every guest room did have a deeply indented balcony, so people could step out, and it was furnished. But even better, every balcony had a built-in concrete planter with some very luxurious trailing vines, which also happened to be drought resistant. The, this was an interesting hotel as far as the client. Uh, the Marriott Corporation at this time actually had their own contracting firm, the Marriott Construction Company. That was both a good thing and a problem. One of the problems was that uh, even during construction and not following what the working drawing showed, all of a sudden there were, there were decisions made to save some, some money one of them was the fact that for about a 4% save, the guest rooms, which were sort of ordinary, would have had 9-foot, 6-inch high ceilings. Very memorable, very airy, very spacious. But to save 4% of the construction budget, they suddenly lowered the floor, floor-to-floor floor heights in the guest rooms from 10 feet to only 8-foot, 6. So they saved money, but in the process, cheapened the experience for uh the guests, Ooh. even worse, they, for, for reasons that still escape me, they decided to remodel the atrium. Now, the, the atrium from the boat dock level at the water to the ceiling was 80 feet high, an enormous space. But as you can see in the photo, it was very green. There were beautiful, luxurious vines hanging from the guest room balconies. But they decided to eliminate the central garden completely, wipe out the waterfalls, remove the hanging vines, and end up with what you see at the bottom left corner, which is sort of a, a sterile lobby bar with an uncomfortable ceiling 65 feet overhead. And then there are these strange pendant lighting fixtures hanging there, uh, all of which is is cheaper to operate. Obviously, waterfalls and greenery maintenance cost money. But to sacrifice that did mean sacrificing the totality of what had been a much happier guest room experience. And I won't go any further than that. Well, and that, the unfortunate thing is that this trend of sort of uglifying is, is continuing as we started to discuss in the volume one with uh, Larry about his Manalani, which aesthetically a little bit, you know, more cultivated, but basically substantially the same way in bringing the project versus bringing it back to its great original authenticity. So we're going to tell all these clients over and over again, we won't get tired. If you're owning a killing's worth, that's an obligation. That's a treasure. It's just like if you have a classic car, you know, that's only preserving its value if you keep it in its original condition. So guys who are all about the money, keep it in your own interest in, or bring it back to the original because then it's going to be worth the most that's as right. to speak within their language. That's right. <laughs> the only language they understand. That's exactly Let's go to right. the next slide, uh, Ron, and get really tropical now. But the other tropics in our continental United States. Now, this is certainly one of the finest examples of modern architecture in semi-tropical Florida. This was the Boca Beach Club Hotel in Cabanas, which also followed some of the design precepts learned in Hawaii. Now, 60 years after the famed architect Addison Meisner, who basically designed Palm Beach himself, he built the Boca Raton Hotel in a very distinctive and elegant and theatrical Spanish style, a revival style. But management wished to augment the old resort with a modern hotel designed to attract a younger, more active group. And uh, this uh, is uh, showing the fact that one way to get to the hotel was by boat. And if you go to the next slide, we're looking down on uh, an aerial view of the hotel. It was located between the Atlantic Ocean 
at the at the right, where the, where you see the White Sand Beach, and an intracoastal waterway on the left, and uh, also in the zoom in on the left, you can see that guest room the guest rooms were provided with balconies at that time. And, and something else that one, you uh, pointed out earlier, Ron, was that uh, this is in an area of hurricanes. And so there would be some additional considerations in the construction and design of this hotel that would have to take that into account. Yeah. Indeed. What we're looking at is another beautiful illustration by the famous Carlos Denis. Next slide. Yeah, we're showing the, the oceanfront development, which was purposefully designed to be very residential in scale. There were some two-story cabanas where people would stay all day uh, enjoying uh, the Florida weather. And to the left of the picture, you see a very interesting sort of uh, concrete structural tour de force. It was a one-story restaurant, but the concrete beams also were hollowed out and were planters as well, uh, just filled with all kinds of beautiful flowering and, and hanging vines forming that sort of low uh, pyramidal sh uh, shape. But if we go to the next slide, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner that about 10 years ago, the Boca Beach Club became a Waldorf Astoria resort. And everything that we saw in the previous slide, the cabanas and that very interesting architectural restaurant, uh, that oceanfront development was completely demolished and replaced with some rather forgettable, uh, small, and rather dinky structures. That's about all I can say about that. <laughs> Something well, else. I, we want to add to that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, on the photo at the bottom of the left, uh, showed, it, and again, the effects of another unfortunate renovation. Very unfortunate, especially in today's times, because the original guest rooms all of them had at least step-out balconies. For whatever reason, in a later renovation, the Waldorf Astoria people, in their infinite wisdom, uh, removed the balconies by pushing uh, fixed glass out to the face of the building. Uh, of course, that made the guest room a little bigger by two or three feet. But when you think of what we're facing today with this seemingly endless pandemic, something we might have to live with for quite some time, the fact that the easy breezy connection to the beautiful weather that usually is there in Florida was lost in a hermetically sealed building is a, is a real tragedy. We need fresh air and air circulation in guest rooms, not hermetically sealed rooms. Right, and not with Absolutely. air conditioning recirculating the used air. Indeed. Yeah, and the free... The three little uh, show quotes uh, illustrate a tragic tradition of importing sort of invasive Floridian architecture with a sort of bad mock-up of uh, Architectonica's great sort of Miami Vice, um, you know, Project the Atlantis way back, which obviously that Howard Hughes Affordable Tower might have been inspired by. And you now the, the show at the very top, you see you, Ron, at the very left, looking at it, we were having coffee at the Starbucks, and you said architectonicus was was a joke, but it was a good joke. This one here is a bad joke. Right. So we got to start, we got to stop to do bad jokes. And obviously the whole state of Florida has unfortunately become the, uh, the, the adopted home of who supposedly runs our country in the United States. So, uh, you know, Florida needs to basically free itself and, and strip back from the hermeticness, from the fakeness, and go back to redevelop, uh, remembering, you know, uh, Paul Rudolph's early ages of the Florida easy breezy homes he kind of did. And as you both said, yes. in these days, being easy breezy means also being easy breezy, and that's more than ever uh, n not just essential, but existential. And, and Ron, you guys were ahead of the game. You created something that we should reconnect to because it can save. Architecture can literally save your life. Right. Uh, at the very least, your, your well-being, right? Yes. Yes. Next slide. Next slide. 
this slide is just showing that, indeed, the original uh, hotel did have at least step-out balconies. They weren't deep enough to furnish, but you could step out, slide your, keep your sliding doors open, and enjoy all that easy, breezy uh, South Florida weather. And in the foreground, also enjoying that beautiful weather uh, and staying fairly decent apart, is a family group. It was a sculpture that Ed Killingsworth particularly liked and selected for a location on the lawn on one side of the hotel, children playing together. And in the next slide... Oh, and, and before we go, Ron, uh, and bring it back for a second, Ron, the last slide, uh, this is obviously our message to the current or future owners. This is what to bring it back to. This is the condition that we want to see again, but they buy us. As we tried to point out, but in the language that you guys understand, which is profit and money making, you want this back because it helps to, you know, and, and you, you know, uh, uh, Zona was sharing that you talked uh, to someone who said, you know, uh, just medical precautions or even vaccines and stuff won't cut it. Sure, is more than ever a, a most integral part in, in, in keeping surviving under these. Paradigms, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, next slide, Ron. Yeah, we're, we're just showing that uh, the hotel uh, is has some formality to it. Uh, some New York interior designers uh, were involved, who were very talented, but they didn't let it get to look so stiff. Uh, and, and they love greenery. So here we see a long a hallway, which actually is open to one side to a view, to, view of the ocean. But it picks up some of that 1920s flavor of Palm Beach. And also, as, as DeSoto reminded me, some of that flavor of those early hotels in Hawaii, like uh, yeah. like the Moana or the Royal Hawaiian. Yes, exactly. And the next, the ne and the next slide is showing, again, that sort of New York elegance and formality but it has that wonderful touch of beautiful ficus trees, beautifully maintained, so that uh, it, it's, it's almost an evocation of uh, Philip Johnson's finest, uh, finest restaurant, the Four Seasons in New York City. Which I think is closed now. I think, they, I, I think it got remodeled, but it ended up being closed. Is that correct, Ron? Do you remember? Yes. They, they closed it for a while. They remodeled it. And as happens too often they remodeled the very life out of it yeah and if we look at the next slide this is my favorite uh, image of, of the show today this entry experience at the Boca Raton Hotel uh, shows Ed Kellingsworth's structural expressionism in its finest hour this is even an improvement on what you find at the Kahala and the wonderful use of the royal palms in architectonic rows to form colonnades and porticos on both sides, enclosing the space. Uh, and this is uh, a, a very unusual night view by the great architectural delineator, Carlos Denise. I have never seen such a rendering attempted of a night view before. And, and uh what a wonderful way to arrive at the hotel, either by car or by boat. Next slide. Yeah, this is, again, showing the, uh, uh, the, the structural expressionism, the columns and beams. And in the, and in the midst of all that surprisingly delicate concrete work is this very strong structural element, which is an elevator core that has openings out to views on four sides. And if we go to the next uh, slide, we'll see how that structural expressionism, expressionism was almost a, a kind of a, a firestorm of columns and beams. Uh, and that is the entry portico uh, experience. And in the next slide, we look at that uh, portico experience from the side. And just as in the past, as is seen on, on many Hawaiian projects on the left side, the beams are the same width as the reveals that run the full length of the columns so that it looks like the beams slide right through uh, the columns. And this provides a wonderful sense 
of uh, of delicacy there. No, and I'm and we want to say hi to Eric Bricker, who's going to do a I was call it a Hollywood movie about your guys' work, and and I hope he will sort of point out that sort of which we like to call the signature style of the, as Don Hibbert calls it, the uh, you know the the flying beans or the flying trellises, and you call it structural expressionism and, and all that more we want to call it, but. You know, when you go through the projects chronologically, you can see how that evolves. It's almost like DNA, the evolution of a DNA that it gets more and more expressed and you guys get more and more creative with it, Brian. Pretty fascinating. I, I would uh, advise viewers to keep in mind what they're seeing on, on the screen right now because the very last slide uh, brings up a tragedy that occurred at this hotel. Can we get the last slide up, Eric, please? Next one. Thank you. It's it, it, you have to look very closely, and that's why we've take, uh, we've taken a little sliver out of that photograph. Uh, the very famous, probably the, the most famous American architectural photographer, Julia Shulman, very very lovingly took the photographs of this hotel. And if you look closely, there's a very eerie sight, and that is that portion of Julia Shulman's face, which I recognize very well, is appearing on, on the column face in this black and white photograph. And those who believe in ghosts, because uh, <laughs> Mr. Shulman died at the age of 99 just a few years ago, might believe that he's haunting the place because, again, in their uh, infinite wisdom, the new management of the hotel completely destroyed the entire entry experience. In other words, they tore down all of the, the columns and beams for, forming the portico. They tore down the rows of royal palms. And what was left was nothing uh, but a, a kind of sterile, windswept plaza. And how and why this happened, I can't begin to imagine because, again, I don't know where they're saving money, and they've only cheapened what had been an exciting arrival experience to one of the most wonderful modern hotels in Florida's uh, recent history. Ron, and let me I'm also just say, time because we're at the we're at oh, yeah. the end of the show, and but we can't close on a on a on a on a down note, on a pessimistic note. So, yeah. Soto, you help us out with telling us about the nature of palm trees in Florida, and that gives us a chance to segue out on a potentially good note. Well, my, my last thing to add is that the Royal Palm, which we've seen just earlier, just a few seconds ago, is native to both South Florida and Cuba, and it is used, it has been used for many years as a sort of an archi a living architectural uh, element to be a very elegant and very upper class and um, special way to not only frame buildings and driveways, but in this particular case, it echoed all of the architectural structure that the Ed Killingsworth Company put in there. And to lose both the palm trees and the structure is a terrible shame, but the palm trees do go on. But that being said, as the natural palm trees are native to Florida, this grove of artificial uh, palm trees is native to the hotel, so no-brainer, the message to the current or future uh, management or ownerships, bring this back. I know. That's obviously all we can say. Yes. And with that, uh, we have to close, but uh, Ron, give us a very brief one, two sentences outlook of what the volume two of this show here will be in the next couple of weeks. Very soon, we'll see a few more uh, projects that were definitely tropical and also inspired by Hawaii. But I'm also going to mention the fact that of the 222 hotel projects commissioned in the Killingsworth office, only 15% was were built. Now, that might sound like a sad way to end the program, but when I talk to you next, I'll explain why that very low batting average for building hotels is really just part and parcel of hospitality design. Okay. okay, and on that note, thank you very much. I look forward to see you for that and more. And until then, please stay easy breezy and easy breezy. 
tropically as you run, uh, Larry and Ed. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>